Hello and welcome to the Creative Tech Podcast, where we discuss how technology can help you to be more creative. This podcast is made by the National Centre for Creativity, enabled by AI, which is a bit of a mouthful, so we call it CBE for short. It's presented by the director of CBE, Professor Neil Maiden. Neil, who's in the studio today? Today, I'm very pleased to be able to welcome our podcast guest, Richard Chataway. Richard heads up an international business consultancy called BBA Nudge Unit, whose job is to help businesses and governments to become more successful. He uses his understanding of human behavioral psychology to come up with processes that compel positive change and successful business adaption. Richard led the development of one of the world's most successful stop smoking apps, MyQuitBuddy, still one of the iPhone's top 10 rated stop smoking apps, seven years after it launched. And last year, he published his first book, The Behavior Business, How to Apply Behavioral Science for Business Success. Richard is one of the most experienced practitioners of behavioral science communications in the UK, and it's a real pleasure to welcome him here on our podcast today. Thank you, and, and uh, thanks very much for inviting me on to the, uh, the podcast. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Richard, a favourite phrase of yours is sciencing the shit out of communication. So what do you mean by that? I think movie fans might recognise um, that it's actually a phrase I've sort of stolen or paraphrased from the movie The Martian. Anyone who hasn't seen it is a film starring Matt Damon. It's about a NASA mission to Mars. There's an accident on the mission. The crew of the the ship not unreasonably assume that Matt Damon's been killed by that accident without giving away too many spoilers. And they leave and he is left behind on Mars and has to fend for himself for for the several years before a rescue mission can get back to, to, to find him. And the thing is, you know, when I was writing my book and I was thinking about ways in which we can apply, successfully apply behavioral science within business. I was looking for kind of metaphors for for some of the ways in which businesses act or or don't act uh, in terms of the application of behavioral science. And and to me, it seemed a really good one because what happens in that scenario is Matt Damon's left there, but he doesn't kind of panic. He doesn't think about the futility of his situation. You know, he's a highly qualified, highly trained scientist. Um, You know, he's been trained for this eventuality in, in a lot of ways by NASA. What he does is he, he, he goes about, you know, sciencing the shit out of the problem is the way he phrases it. And so to my mind, one of the things that I've, I've addressed in my work and what I wanted to address in my book was why we don't science the shit out of communication enough. You know, why don't we apply the knowledge we now have about what triggers behaviour change in how we approach communication specifically, but, but more generally, I think, in terms of how we apply behavioural science. There's, there's too much we're doing in business, which ignores the latest evidence on what drives people's behavior you know we've learned more in the last 50 years about behavior change than we probably did in the previous 5,000 there's lots of new knowledge out there that's just not being successfully applied Mm -hmm. the most effective way to do that is scientifically to apply it in a scientific way to use that existing evidence base to conduct experiments to test and learn and adapt accordingly so that's what I mean by science in the shift out of communication it is taking that existing knowledge around what actually is effective and then applying that in a scientific fashion to find out what works. So which which scientific disciplines do you tend to draw on when you're talking about behaviour change? I use behavioural science as a sort of catch-all, I guess, to cover behavioural economics. There's elements of of neuroscience we'll occasionally draw on in what we do, but but really it's anything that informs and helps us gain an understanding of what actually you know, influences behavior and how to best influence behavior. So sometimes, you know, there's elements of anthropology, which is very helpful, and, you know, more general social science disciplines, which uh, we'll draw on to, to do that. But at its core, really, is the understanding of the, some of the non-conscious drivers of behavior. So, you know, the thing that's most frequently ignored in terms of understanding what drives people's behavior and how to influence behavior is the understanding that a lot of our behavior is non-conscious and non-rational not necessarily irrational all the time because there's usually some kind of you know rationale going on even if it's a spurious one or something that's a post-rationalization but there is something going on there that we can understand you know the the fact that it may a lot of behavior may be non-rational does not mean it's not systematic or predictable 
then that's what we're drawing on and what we do. So, you know, to give an example, you know, I started working in this field about 15 years ago on anti-smoking communications. And, you know, one of the things that really informed our work and one of the insights we took from social psychology, which really changed the way that we worked and was fundamental to my quit buddy that you mentioned in, in the, my introduction, was this understanding that, you know, simply telling people why smoking is bad and about the health consequences of smoking is effective up to a point. Everyone knows smoking cigarettes is bad for you, but yet there is a, still a, a sizable proportion of the population who still persist in smoking. And when you ask them about it, the vast majority, anything between 80 and 90% of the people generally say, I wish I didn't smoke, I wish I could quit. But the reasons they don't quit is it's highly addictive and you can get cravings for a cigarette at any time of day or night. The, the insight behind my quit buddy was, what's the one thing everyone has 24 hours a day within arm's reach? Because that's cravings can hit at any time of day or night, it's your mobile phone. So we need a mobile based solution for that. We didn't just create an app because it was another channel to reach smokers. It was, this is the most effective way for people to get help whenever they need it at 3 a.m. if they've suddenly, you know, got a craving for a cigarette. And that's what proved, why it proved to be so successful. The value and benefit of taking a behaviorally informed approach is, is demonstrated by that and many other projects that, that worked on subsequently that, you know, it's just more effective if you can understand some of these non-rational drivers of behavior. Fascinating. So we're interested in creativity and you head up the, the BVA nudge unit and there are tools to help people be creative. Do you think we can nudge people to be more creative in their everyday activities? Yeah, it's a very interesting um, question that and I do genuinely think so. One of the challenges that we face in our work at BVA nudge unit is, is the perception that having a focus on science is antithetical to having a, a focus on creativity. And the reality is, is that the solutions that we develop, there is a really key component to that, which is creativity. Going back to that point about these biases and heuristics that we know people have that guide their decision making on a daily basis. There's over 200 of those that have been identified in research. There's a huge number of biases and heuristics to choose from. Understanding which are the ones that are going to be effective in a particular context is really important. To identify what is going to create an intervention to determine what to test requires a huge amount of creativity. And in fact, we have a co-creation process we call Nudge Labs, which is all about creative thinking and, and co-creation. For example, we did a, a Nudge Lab with a railway company a couple of years ago about passenger behavior. And not only did we have key clients of the railway company in the room, as well as our team, we also had train drivers, conductors, station staff, because you know, one, they're dealing with these issues every day, Two, they don't really get the opportunity to come and be creative in that way. You know, their jobs are engineering based. And, and if they're a train driver, for example, they are very strict rules for good reason that they have to operate with it. So the opportunity for them to think more creatively was something they're very excited about. But most importantly, you know, they have, in some cases, decades of experience of observing these behaviours from passengers. That's a way in which in the work that we do, we nudge people into being creative. We you know, give them the insights, we give them the tools. And in that forum, we say, right, generate ideas. And we typically come out of those sessions with hundreds of ideas. And then we have a, a kind of conversion thinking process where we, where we get down to the ones we think are going to be most effective. And, and that's one way in which we're nudging people to be creative. And I think there's lots of great evidence and studies around the ways in, and the context can facilitate or limit creativity and, and creative thinking. We've done a number of projects around what we call nudge management. So these are looking at behaviours within organisations. Often the interventions that we develop are around encouraging certain behaviours and creativity is very much one of those. Um, so the short answer is absolutely. There is, there is a concept that's been studied quite a lot in psychology research around creative self-belief that people have potential be creative but they don't see themselves as creative or they don't mm. see train driving as creative mm. and that's often an inhibitor do you do you have a view of how nudge practices could help people to be more creative every day in a small mm. ways which is very much a focus of our center yeah yeah absolutely one thing that for me is a really important aspect of that and something i wrote about in my book actually is is psychological safety and sciencing the shit out of problems and, and having the license to do that and feeling that you have the freedom and the autonomy to be able to test things and try things out. Psychological safety is obviously a really important 
concept within that. And there are nudges that you could employ to encourage greater psychological safety. Things like challenging people to make a suggestion for a new improvement to a particular process. We know from behavioral science that defaults are very powerful. So if you set something as a as a default, um, that our innate tendency towards inertia means that we will go along with that. So if you were to make it a mandatory, for example, that that, that was part of everyone's KPIs, was, you know, those kind of nudges in those contexts are not often considered. If you change those defaults around someone's role and their perception of the role and that they have the psychological safety and the autonomy to be able to be creative, then the understanding that behaviour precedes attitudinal change rather than the other way around. And, um, you know, we, we, we have a tendency to think of we need to change people's attitudes towards a particular issue for their behaviour to follow. And, and, and that's not necessarily true. So I think, well, we can take some of these ideas, I think, of psychological safety and inertia into some of our design projects. So, so thank you. Um, thinking more about technology, uh, according to a 2017 Gallup State of the Global Workplace report, 75% of workers are disengaged from their work. Do you think that creativity and tech could help reverse this? And if so, how? Yes. Um, uh, well, I, I mean, it's a shocking stat, isn't it? Um, and, and, you know, one wonders as well how much that's changed over the last two years um, as a result of, you know, the, the conditions we're working under uh, in COVID. I, I, there's a great quote from, from John Amici I, I saw the other day. He was a leadership expert and um, former NBA player. And he said, um, you know, there's a big difference between working from home and working from home in a pandemic. You know, when we think about engagement with work, the circumstances we've been living under for the last two years, the impact that that had is significant. So, you know, if we're starting from that low base already, it's only going to get uh, worse. Rory Sutherland, who wrote the forward to my book, says test counterintuitive things because your competitors won't. In a business context, if you can come up with something that's counterintuitive, it gives you an advantage. So you should be looking at non-rational things and creativity is required to come up with non-rational things. Creativity is a fundamental of, of developing something that's counterintuitive or non-instinctive. In terms of disengagement, we know that psychological safety is really important in terms of motivating people. Um, autonomy is really important in terms of, of motivating people. The feeling that your work matters to some degree and that you have the ability to shape that is really important and so providing the tools and the environments for people to be creative in that way is a great way to, to drive that engagement and technology has obviously been hugely important and fundamental to a lot of us to, to maintain engagement right. literally with our colleagues when we're not able to all be in the same physical environment you know i'm part of a global company and this week was the first time that I'd seen my UK colleagues for over a year physically. And that, what that's meant is that I've spent as much time talking to and engaging with my global colleagues as my UK based colleagues. And so that perception that I have of being part of a global business and working with my global colleagues has definitely changed as a result of that, which is you know, a positive thing. And that's been entirely facilitated by technology, by you know, video technology, like what we're using right now. So there is definitely the opportunity for technology to create those greater engagements. What we know is there are obviously too much reliance on technology or too much reliance on the wrong technology has, can have a negative impact. And, and some of the, the recent studies that have come out about, for example, Zoom and, and why the concept of Zoom fatigue exists are really fascinating. We just don't like it staring at our faces too long. We do a lot of work uh, around optimizing communications using behavioral techniques. There's huge amounts that can be done to make sure that communication tools are working effectively and driving right behaviors. The way I summarize it is how you say something's important as what you say. So when you're writing an email to someone, if you want to elicit a response and you want them to behave in a certain way, you need to think about the way you're framing that information. Mm, mm. Think about them as the recipient rather than you exactly. would transmit yeah, and what you want to say. And so, you know, it's that combination of the medium and the message is, is really critical. Okay, fascinating. So at CBay, our purpose is to build tech that supports and inspires people to be 
because they're most creative cells, problem solving, collaborating and interacting daily. We're phrasing this as creativity on demand. So in this regular feature, I've got three questions to test your creativity on demand, quite quick fire. The first is, what is the single most important thing you require in order to be creative every day? Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a really good question. And actually just asking the question really prompted me to consider <laughs> in a lot of way. Because um, I guess this is one thing I learned from writing a book in particular, which is, you know, a creative endeavour, although a business book obviously is, is writing a novel, and, and, and I would imagine, I've never having written a novel. But, you know, it does require a creativity that it's space, really, and, and not, you know, and that's both time and, and a physical space to do it. So, you know, I, I saw a great talk last week by John Cleese. I'm sure you're aware of a, a lot of his his previous work around creativity. And one thing that really struck a chord from what he was saying was that, you know, if you sit down to write something, what he used to find when he sat down to write a book or a sketch or, or whatever it might be, the first few hours, he'd write very little and find that it was a real struggle. And then it would often be he'd have to walk away from it, do something else completely different. And then he would be standing in the garden and then suddenly the idea would hit him. And this is where behavioural science is really useful and, and has informed my own approach to creativity. You realise that when you're doing one task, your brain is also thinking about any number of other things or is processing information. And I think it's Richard Thaler, who's one of the co-authors of, uh, of Nudge, who, who says you should always sleep on an important decision. And the reason for that is that if you if you make an important decision quickly, then you're largely engaging your system one processes mm -hmm. and your biases and heuristics. And as we know from our work, they can often lead to, to suboptimal outcomes. Okay. If, you sleep, if you sleep on an important decision, there's a whole load of processing you'll be doing without being consciously aware of it, such that in the morning you've moved out of the more emotional state you might be in the previous day, and you're able to make a much more rational decision. Mm -hmm. And in the same way with creativity, there's a whole load of information that's being processed at a subconscious level that you're not aware of. And so if you come back to got a problem that needs creative problem solving, you need to create space to do that. So when I wrote a book, going back to that, in essence, I had to write it at weekends, which, you know, didn't make me very popular with my wife, but it was the only way I could do it because of having spent a day of my everyday work, one, there was just mental fatigue that meant that sitting down to do a creative endeavour just wasn't really practical uh, or wasn't, you know, I would have just sat there staring at the screen for three hours most likely. And mm -hmm. during the week, my brain would be thinking about ideas for the book or, you know, would be thinking about concepts. And then when I came to sit down at the weekend, I was able to do that. So it's all about finding time to incubate really, isn't it? That's, that's exactly, the yeah, that's a succinct way of putting it. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So second question, if you could create any app that could do anything real or imaginary, what would it be? Well, I think linking into that, I think if there was a, you know, if you could create an app which could in some way tell you how that non-conscious processing was happening and when. <laughs> if you're like, I'm thinking about it, you know, you know, like a loading bar, for instance. Mm -hmm. So complete or whatever. If you were there's if there's some way where you could be made aware of, oh, you've you know, you completed 75% of the processing around this particular this thought issue you're working on, then that would be the holy grail, really. Because then you would know, you know, I think in the work that we do, because this is often the project work that we do, we're always thinking about productivity, but not in a very, dare I say, a kind of management consultancy style. Mm -hmm. or, you know, utilisation rates and that kind of thing. We think a lot about when is the right time and the right place to do certain tasks, because that's, we know that those contexts are hugely important in terms of people's behaviours. So I'm th always thinking about, okay, right, you know, I've got this window of time. What is the task that I can complete? You know, with this window between two Zoom calls, for example, what's the task I can complete in that time? And obviously, you know, there are deadlines and some things are more urgent than others that you have to take into account. But but that's the way I think about activity. So, you know, any apps that help with that, 
one which can tell me when that non-conscious processing is done. There's certainly some kind of work with science fiction writers to explore an idea that <laughs> with designs are like that. And third question, if you could remove one thing from the world in order to make humans or yourself more creative, what would you bin? Well, this is, so this is something I'm going to steal from someone else. But Daniel Kahneman, who is a Nobel Prize winner and, and sort of, I guess, the founding father of behavioral economics to some degree, he says if he had a magic wand, the thing that he would remove is overconfidence. And I really think that's a fantastic summation of, I think, what a lot of the issues, particularly in the business world, we face are, which is there's a lot of misconceptions, there's a lot of presumptions that people make, particularly about behavior, which is largely based on overconfidence. And in fact, you know, if you are willing to embrace those concepts of, you know, psychological safety and the willingness to test and learn, you, you can't be overconfident, really, because what you're continually doing is, well, you know, we don't know the answer to this, but let's find out. And that's an anathema to overconfidence. And, and we tend to, I think, give more credence to and, and overpromote <laughs> people who, who project confidence over competence, perhaps would be a way I put it. And, and I think that's the one thing I would be in. Fantastic. Thank you. What's next for you then, Richard? Well, you kindly mentioned my book and a podcast, which is also called The Behaviour Business. I've just started the second season of that. So the first season was interviews with the experts I consulted for writing my book. So it isn't just what I think. There's about 25 experts I spoke to to inform my book. And the second season, I've kind of taken a slightly different angle, which is I'm interviewing other authors of books, either about or relevant to the world of behavioral science to get their kind of perspective. Because I wrote my book, or I started writing it in 2018. It came out a year ago, and, and you know, quite a lot's happened since then, <laughs> well, in general, but also in, in the behavioral science world. So I'm looking to build, you know, get the latest insights from those people. So I've done a couple of interviews with Melina Palmer who's a, a brilliant behavioral science uh, consultant and academic. She lectures in, in the US, predominantly on marketing and customer behavior. And then Andy Nairn, who is one of the kind of world's leading advertising planners and strategists. I've known Andy for a, a long time. When I was working on tobacco, anti-smoking, he, he was the strategist working at the advertising agency for us. He's a brilliant guy. He's got a new book that's just come out called Go Luck Yourself, amusingly. <laughs> <laughs> which is a brilliant book um, and sort of summation of many years of wisdom from him. So, yeah, so I'm working on that podcast. As you mentioned, I'm, I'm CEO at BBA Nudge Unit. We are working with a, a wide range of clients and the business is, is growing fast, which is great um, in, a, in a variety of different sectors. And, and within BBA Nudge Unit as well, we're producing quite a lot of our own, just produced our own book actually that came out last week, which has articles by myself, but as well as my colleagues from across the global team. And I'm um, working with a variety of organizations from the likes of the UN to major global brands like um, Kellogg's and HSBC, as well as NGOs like Save the Children and others. So work keeps me pretty busy, but, <laughs> but I'm trying to, um, to keep the eyes in other fires as well. Fantastic. So Richard's book, The Behaviour Business, How to Apply Behavioural Science for Business Success, is fascinating. We, we've taken a look at it. It's well worth a read. And I should add that Richard has very generously shared a discount code with us. You can get 25% off directly at the publisher's website using the code BB2021. That's harrimanhouse.com forward slash behaviour business and use the code bb 2021 for the 25% discount. So thank you for talking to us, Richard. We hope that you will take the time out uh, to like the podcast and leave a review. It really does make a difference to us. You can also follow us on Twitter uh, at CBay or on LinkedIn at the Creativity Enabled by AI page. So thank you again, Richard. Fascinating talking to you, some insights that I'll certainly be taking into our work. And um, looking forward to also listening to your podcast. Thanks very much. Pleasure.